Hello, I'm Tony Geider. This is My New York. Bulletin, gridlock Sam Schwartz is going off the grid. Well, that's a little bit of an exaggeration. I just wanted to grab your attention. But Sam Schwartz, former cab driver, one-time city traffic commissioner, and one of this country's leading transportation engineers, is changing lanes. Among other things, he's writing a novel. Gridlock Sam Schwartz, next. Sam Schwartz, good to see you. It's been a while. Great to see you again, Tony. You know, New Yorkers, of course, know you as gridlock, Sam, traffic commissioner and former traffic commissioner and with the Department of Transportation. But they may not know that you are one of this country's leading transportation engineers. And your company has done transportation projects all over the country and even internationally. But now a big change. You've sold that company are you packing it in well i'm not completely packing it in tony yes uh, i own the company i started the company in 1995 so i owned it for 26 years i had an investor starting to invest uh, from spain a few years ago <clears throat> that investment kept growing until they became majority owners last year and uh, they sold their company to an international company out of the Middle East. But I'm going to still do some consulting for that company. And uh, I'm always going to be a gadfly and a kibitzer. And uh, <laughs> if, I'm, if there's a mayor out there that's or governor who's doing something I don't like, you can be sure you'll still hear from me as Gridlock Sam. I'll still be in the Daily News uh, writing my regular columns. Glad to hear you'll still be in the Daily News. And uh, of course, we want you to continue being a gadfly. But I don't know, a week or so, a while ago, you told me there is a brand new project that you're working on. And uh, folks might not associate it with Sam Schwartz. What is that? Uh, well, Tony, I've written a few books uh, in the past. And those books are really on the science of transportation or traffic engineering. And I wrote a book about autonomous vehicles. I decided this time to try my hand at writing a novel Wow! on autonomous vehicles. And I don't want to give away too much, but there are a couple of bad guys in there. There's a good guy who turns bad and a bad guy who stays bad. And autonomous vehicles are simply computers on wheels. Mm -hmm. and so we've seen the hacking of computers and you can imagine some of what takes place, but there are plenty of surprises that I don't want to give away. Okay, I can understand that. But uh, it sounds um, like maybe this could be more than a novel. Maybe this could be a TV show or a movie. What, what, what do you think? Yeah, we're, we're talking to a few people. A friend of mine is a screenwriter. And we're talking about the possibility of a movie. I think it lends itself uh, very nicely to that because there's <laughs> obviously a lot of action with autonomous vehicles and the yeah. kinds of things they can do. So you don't know, it could be both a novel and a movie. All right. Um, your goal in your career, 50 plus years, has been to keep car vehicles out of Midtown, out of cities, out of central cities. Uh, but we're at a crisis that I'm sure you're aware of. We're at a crisis once again in this city where traffic is back almost to pre-pandemic levels, even though the workers haven't returned en masse to the office building. And subway ridership is down. How do you, how do you see that crisis and, and what's the answer? Yeah, so to, Tony, my goal has never been to eliminate cars. It's really to get it to the level where it's manageable and where it's safe. And that's a lot lower than where it's been historically. And so for many years, I've been pushing for some kind of pricing control. People refer to it as congestion pricing. And uh, uh, four years ago, the governor finally endorsed congestion pricing. In 2019, legislation was passed. And then we had a, we had a Republican administration that did not uh, give any clue to the state as to the kind of environmental statement it needed. The Biden administration has done that. So we have 
the possibility of completing the work for congestion pricing. And we're going to need it more than ever, because with the pandemic, what happened is the mode of transportation that got hit the hardest was public transportation. Even though study after study showed that it's not a vector, it's not a place where there's transmission if you're wearing a mask in transit, even in the subway system. Uh, nonetheless, people are shying away from the transit system and driving. So driving numbers are pretty close to normal in the New York area. And if traffic feels worse, particularly on expressways, it's because truck traffic is at, at, at 110% of where it was pre-pandemic. Why is that? because we're all expecting those trucks to come right to our house instead of us going to the store where the truck would have delivered whatever products we're buying. So traffic is indeed worse than it was before on expressways, not quite as bad as it was in the heart of midtown Manhattan because a lot of people are still working from home, but on the highway system, it's pretty bad. And uh, of course, Sam, you mentioned uh, subway ridership being down despite a lot of studies that show it's not a, a, a hotbed for, for transmitting a virus. But what do we do now? Congestion pricing is, is an idea that's going to bring, at least we're told, going to bring uh, billions to mass transit when it's finally instituted. But I, you know, I'm going to debate this a little with you. To me, it looks like it's at least two years away, maybe more. Yeah, congestion pricing is targeted to bring about $15 billion in capital funds to the MTA. And we know the MTA can certainly use that. And it's not just the subways and buses, it's also uh, Metro North and the Long Island Railroad. So that, that's quite a bit of money. There's been some good infusion of money, but uh, the work could be done in 2021 to get this implemented at the beginning of 2022. However- well, Go ahead. However, the big however is what is 2022? It's an election year, a state yeah. election year. So <laughs> I find elected officials get pretty shy of implementing something that means people will take money out of their pockets uh, to pay the government. Uh, so I predict that we're likely two years away from seeing congestion pricing. But it goes even deeper than that, the fact that this thing is uh, well, it depends, first of all, on a, there's a special board that has to be constituted to, to, to meet and decide how much is the toll going to be and who, if anybody, uh, is going to be exempted from it. But uh, that board hasn't even been constituted yet. And uh, the MTA hasn't named its members. Governor controls the MTA. Why not? I mean, what's going on? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a puzzle. So that leaves us with uh, an amorphous plan. We know the area, we know it's Manhattan South of 60th Street. We know that the West Side Highway and the FDR Drive are exempt if you ride them the enti that entire distance, 60th down to the Battery or to the Brooklyn Bridge. We know that uh, low-income people within the district uh, may have some exemptions to it and for vehicles carrying people with disabilities but we don't know the price. We don't know the time of day. We don't know if it'll be seven days a week. We don't know if it'll be seasonal. So there are already people screaming about a plan that we know so little about. Right. All right, I, wanna, I want to uh, bring up another facet or aspect of this about the MTA. They have to complete an environmental assessment plan. It, it's less than they had to do before because the Biden administration uh, made it so. But they haven't started on that yet. And, um, and they claim that they haven't, if I read them correctly, they claim they haven't uh, uh, named the members of the board because they're working on the environmental assessment or beginning to work on, uh, you know, a civilian, a taxpayer asks, why can't they do both things at the same time? Yeah, I, I believe the environmental assessment is largely written by now. So uh, I think there is a document uh, they're, they've been working on it since 2019. Well, they haven't released it to anyone. One of the curveballs that the Biden administration has thrown is they said they want to include uh, New Jersey and Connecticut in this discussion. Exactly. And uh, that means a lot of public hearings. So I think there will be a document followed by a lot of public hearings. And once the public gets involved, and it always takes months, if, if not longer, just to go through the 
that public process of announcement. Uh, at that point, New York is a very litigious place. I suspect there will be some type of lawsuit or injunction, and uh, the more likely date seems to be 2023. As you know, I've been pushing this for decades. People coming in through the Lincoln Tunnel or through the Holland Tunnel from New Jersey are already paying a hefty fee of about yeah. $13 during the peak periods, $11 off peak. That should be deducted from the congestion fee. So let's say the congestion fee is $15. They should only have to pay $2. Okay. They, they um, the Battery Tunnel or, or the Queens Midtown Tunnel. A quick question about the fees. They, they've already uh, been um, added to the meters of, of taxi cabs and uh, uh, the rideshare uh, uh, companies, Uber, Lyft, and all. What's happening to all that money? Where's it going? That's going directly into the MTA. There's a direct fund in which uh, the money that is collected every single time you take a taxi south of 96th Street. This is a different area than, than the congestion zone, which is south of 60th Street. But if you take an Uber or a Lyft or a Via or a taxi cab, or now these new Revel Teslas, uh, I suspect they'll have to pay a fee as well. Uh, those fees have been collected since February of 2019, and those fees have been supporting the uh, MTA. We're talking this this could be a couple of years, maybe even three years away. But what what can we do now to help with the traffic and to get people back on the subway? So. It looks like no matter what we do, we're not going to get subway ridership back where it was before for a couple of reasons. One is work from home will be uh, greater than it's, than it's ever been. Uh, this was a game changer for a lot of businesses realizing they don't need to have their workers showing up every single day. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to see as many people riding the subway going into the central business district. The second thing is I think there will be some lingering fear and there people have already made some modal changes. Some of them are very good to bicycles and some have made it to e-bikes and some are walking more and that will continue. Some are doing it on scooters, motorized scooters. So we may look more like uh, Rome or Barcelona with all the scooters out there. So uh, that will con continue going into the future. Uh, what we may need to do, because there still will be a lot of people that have switched to cars, is what we did during the 1980 transit strike and what we did uh, during Hurricane Sandy and after 9-11, and that's occupancy restrictions on cars coming into the central business district. Mm, so back yeah. then, I, I was uh, in charge of the city's strike plan in 1980. Uh, you needed two or more people to come into Manhattan. The same thing after 9-11. And after 9-11, that lasted for over two years for the lower Manhattan crossings. And the same thing after Hurricane Sandy. So the city does have some tools if the traffic numbers get too high. Well, that's where you got the name Gridlock Sam, 1980, with the, with the transit strike and, uh, you know, ordering that uh, if there weren't two people in the car, that car's not coming into. Anyway, Sounds like a wonderful idea for these times. Um, you mentioned uh, looking like uh, Barcelona and Rome. Uh, I quickly want to uh, ask you about something that make that reminds me anyway of international cities. All those restaurant uh, uh, outdoor sheds for dining, um, which I happen to love, but uh, uh, I wonder if that's the best use of public space. Yeah, there needs to be a whole review. Now, one thing to remember is if we went back uh, 100, 120 years, you'd see most of the sidewalks are wider than they are now. So maybe, maybe we go back to, to some extent to wider sidewalks. Mm. Fifth Avenue, for example, had 30-foot uh, sidewalks, and then we added two car lanes, and they went down to 22-foot sidewalks. Park Avenue had this huge median in the very center of it. And lots of our streets had wider sidewalks. So that's one possibility. The, the biggest problem is curbside access for trucks. So we're gonna have to figure out something clever where the trucks can get in perhaps in the morning before the restaurants are as active and before the traffic volumes get too high uh, and get their deliveries in. So it's, it is a puzzle. 
it is a, a conundrum because everybody wants to share that curb space. It's the truckers, it's the restaurants, it's the bike riders, the buses uh, on the right side of the street. Uh, and we need a plan rather than what we did, which was good, but is somewhat just wherever there was demand, somebody put up a restaurant, we now need a firm plan going forward. Um, I, I wonder, do you, do you see, uh, what's your feeling? Are, are they going to be made permanent or, uh, or are we going to have to devise this new overall plan for how we use streets before that decision is taken? I, I think we're going to see a number of them made permanent pretty quickly. New businesses that also want to use the street. There are now businesses that are saying, well, why just restaurants? Why can't we? Uh, use the street as well. So this is going to be a challenge for the current mayor and probably a bigger challenge for the new mayor. Let's talk about a subject that's dear to your heart, and you mentioned it earlier, biking. Uh, Michael Kimmelman, the architecture critic of the Times, recently wrote about his uh, view that this city could become and should become a biking city and laid out all kinds of ideas in regard to that. And you've had plenty over your, your career. Let's start with the Queen's Ribbon. What is it? Uh, the, the Queen's Ribbon is something that uh, I and a, a few other engineers have worked on during the early days of COVID. Many of our businesses uh, were uh, reduced. We had a lot of free time. We decided to do some pro bono work. And uh, we, when I say we, it includes the N NYU School of Engineering, and it includes a company called T.Y. Lin. And I led the effort to uh, conceptually design a bridge that would go from Long Island City, which is a burgeoning community with lots of development, lots of opportunity. It's the area that Amazon wanted to expand to. Mm -hmm. uh, there are lots of businesses, lots of residents there. Uh, right across, uh, right in the middle is Roosevelt Island with the Cornell Technion campus where you have lots of young people that would love to be able to ride. And then as you cross the river into Manhattan, you have a big promenade that is going to be constructed in the East River, uh, which you can touch down to. So imagine you can go from Long Island City to Cornell Technion campus to Midtown Manhattan, strolling or bike riding. And we need, as Michael Kimmelman points out, we do need more bike lanes. We have over 60 car lanes across the East River, and we have just about four or five uh, lanes for bikes and pedestrians. We could use more, and the Queen's Ribbon is one of the ideas. Uh, we have another one from Brooklyn to uh, Manhattan, which is what's behind me, if I move a little bit. Yeah, so yeah. Too much. Um, and then there are no there's no way for people from New Jersey to get to Manhattan Central Business District directly by bicycle or walking. That's a shame and that's a mistake. People in Jersey City have city bike right opposite in Battery Park City is city bike. They're one mile apart and you can't get from one place to the other place. So uh, I also think we should be looking at crossing the Hudson with bikes as well. Sam, I want to go to some statistics that, you know, I'm stealing from you and, and uh, your great knowledge of all of this. When you talk about the idea of a bridge, let's say from Long Island City and, and all the possibilities that could bring for people walking across to Manhattan or biking across, um, I, I read where you talked about um, the Brooklyn Bridge, which is one of the great walking experiences in, in this city, walking back and, you know, either way. Uh, across the Brooklyn Bridge. But uh, it, when it was first made, first built, the Brooklyn Bridge was for, for trains, pedestrians, and bikes. And it carried, I think, 400,000 people a day. Then sometime later, it was quote unquote modernized so cars could use it. And now uh, that took up a lot of the space. And now the Brooklyn Bridge handles less than half that number, 400,000 a day. Um, so the car, you know, has always been king in this culture and in this city. Um, and you have said that, uh, you know, more bikes and more things like the Queen's Ribbon uh, are really about political courage. And I wonder if we had the political courage to do this. 
Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. And, and Tony, yeah, you got those, those stats right. The Brooklyn Bridge, I would, I would add, when it opened in 1883, had a toll across. It was a penny for a pedestrian. It was three cents for, if you were in a carriage. And by the 1900, those automobiles that came along that would charge 10 cents. In 1911, Mayor Gaynor removed the tolls from the bridge. But it's kind of interesting because uh, the statistics of the bridge once handling 400,000, and after we modernized, it moves 170,000. Uh, I heard, heard uh, Bill de Blasio use that in a news conference, and one of the press people told me where he got it from me <laughs> yeah. on it. We, uh, all, we get all this stuff from you, Sam. But uh, what he did is, is pretty courageous. Uh, he took a lane from the Brooklyn Bridge, from the Manhattan-bound Brooklyn Bridge, and he's completing it uh, so that it will be a bicycle lane. So instead of three car lanes, we're going to have two car lanes, one bicycle lane, and therefore the promenade, which, ha which is beautiful, has become so hard to use because pedestrians and bike riders have conflicts all the time. It will be the pedestrians on the promenade, the bike riders on the roadway, and you'll see uh, a, a, a turn towards a better balance of the use of the Brooklyn Bridge. Talk about those bridges that you've uh, designed and, and they're beautiful things. What, what, what about the cost? Uh, the Queen's Ribbon, the bridge itself, would cost about $100 million. And then there's the approach roads or the approach uh, ramps that would go down to Long Island City and go somehow tie into the promenade around Manhattan. So add another 50 or 75 million. So probably we're talking about 175 million with all the rescue funds that we did get. This would be a pretty good use of our money. It's a healthy way to travel uh, ecologically it's, and uh, on air quality, uh, excellent for the environment. Talking, Sam, about political courage, uh, the, the mayor, the city administration now has plans, or at least they announced plans to add, I think it was 30 miles of bike lanes a year. Uh, of course, this administration is going out of office, uh, but they're, they're, they're pretty far behind even on that plan. So I wonder how much, uh, you know, you could speak candidly here, but cars are king, aren't they? And politicians don't like to, to anger drivers. I mean, is, is, is a biking city, Michael Kimmelman's uh, vision and your vision, um, a realistic in, in our political climate? Yeah, you know, it's not just a biking city. I call it more balanced transportation, which the car certainly has a role, but rather than having a role of moving people more than 50% of the time, maybe 25% of the time, and bicycles taking up part of that and transit taking up part of that, what happens is the process goes through every community board. And in every community board, when you put in a bike lane, someone loses a parking spot or a few people lose parking spots. Mm -hmm. And in the planning process, the losers scream much louder than the winners sing. So what we hear from are the people that feel that this is gonna negatively affect them as opposed to the people that this will benefit. The biking community has gotten itself so well organized that it's placed many of its members in community boards. So it's getting a little bit easier for a mayor to proceed uh, with a plan like that. Uh, before we go, I wanna squeeze in a question about driverless cars. Of course, you wrote a book about that two or three years ago. Um, I don't own a car. I used to own a car. I like to drive. I, uh, I, I have just never understood why we need a world where cars are going around without people driving them, but maybe uh, it, you can give me a, uh, a, ver a thumbnail uh, explanation. This is a good idea. Yeah, yeah. The why in a place like Manhattan doesn't seem to make sense. We can walk just about every place. We could take the subway. We could take the bus. Uh, we could take an Uber taxi. There's so many forms of transportation. And it's going to be a long time before they, they can solve the problem of pedestrians. However, when it comes to uh, trucks, freight, there's a shortage of truck drivers. It may make sense 
to have some autonomous uh, vehicles on freeways, on expressways. Mm -hmm. It may also make sense in areas that are poorly served by transit to have a form of micro transit rather than the big lumbering bus with a driver associated with every bus, maybe triple the number of buses at the same cost. And that driver becomes a maintainer and a monitor of the three buses. So there are places where autonomous vehicles make sense for those people who can't get, get around, they can't drive any longer, or uh, they have uh, some type of disability that prevents them from driving. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of good reasons for some autonomous vehicles, but uh, it's not gonna replace the car uh, very, very soon. All right, Sam Schwartz, always great information from you. It's good to see you. And uh, let me extend an invitation right now. When the novel is done, uh, I, wanna, I want you to come back and we'll talk about. Okay, you're on, Tony. All we'll right. First. Thank you, Sam. Thank you.